This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. Welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Podcast with your host, Dr. Tony Huang. Today, I'm with Kathleen Voss. Kathleen, can you a background on yourself and your journey through the AI world and what drew you into this field? Sure, absolutely. I'm an engineer, and I've more or less made it my mission to build AI tools that tackle practical social challenges, I guess, ever since college. I'm from Germany originally. I was lucky enough to go to Stanford for a bachelor's, master's, half a PhD in AI, dropped out twice started a couple of research projects and companies, including one at the company with my with my current co-founder, Tom at Ello, built a learning aid for autistic kids, built a company in Kenya for a while, and, and I'm now back in child development space working on a new company called Ello that is looking to eradicate childhood illiteracy. So we teach kids to read. Our mission is to give every child access to uh, a one-on-one AI reading instructor. That instructor comes in the shape of an elephant who works to inspire love for reading. How do you view the intersect of AI and education, especially in that context of childhood literacy? Yeah, I think if you take it to the fundamentals, we know what works in education, right? What works is one-on-one attention of an engaged adult, like this sort of setting. This works actually quite well. Right. And we've known that since the 80s, one-on-one tutoring delivers two standard deviations, higher learning outcomes in a conventional classroom setting. But the problem is, of course, it's not scalable. I think the, the biggest opportunity that AI gives us is to scale one-on-one instruction. It gives us the tools to give every child their perfect one-on-one instructor. And so we're starting to do that with reading. We're starting to do it with reading because it's the foundation of all other learning, right? You learn to read and then you read to learn. And in the information age, if you never learn to read, then that second part is just going to be really hard. Um, And so we think of that as the the foundation of everything else. It's a national and international crisis in the US. um, 69% of fourth graders don't read at level. And if you think about that for a second, like they just moved to the next phase of school where they expected to use reading as a tool for everything else going forward. And fundamentally, it's not something that's taught that easily in a large classroom setting, right? Everyone's in a different place and, you know, it's a it's a fairly nuanced game. Um, and so we provide tooling um, to either support teachers or where, where, where there isn't one-on-one support available for a child to give the child the ability to uh, practice reading in a confident and independent way get support as they read out loud, get phonics-based instruction when they get stuck, and ultimately have this sort of infinitely patient elephant who, unlike your parent, does not judge you, never gets mad, never gets tired, is always encouraging motivational psychology baked in with the goal to to inspire love for reading. So I I know that the pandemic has shifted many aspects in our lives. Can you dive into a little bit deeper into the challenges that like kids face with reading when it's in like a type of a remote learning phase? Because I imagine like back when pa- the pandemic started, everyone had to stay home and but yeah. kids, kids are still growing. So they still have to learn what were like, like the big challenges that like parents and kids face when they're trying to teach these kids the basics on how to read. 
Yeah, this is actually you telling the founding story of Hello, right? It was my co-founder, Elizabeth, was sat there on Zoom at home like everyone else with her kids like everyone else. And her six-year-old, Lily, was struggling to read. Now, Elizabeth's name is actually Dr. Elizabeth Adams. She's a clinical child psychologist who spent 20 years working with kids and families and schools and all sorts of settings. And so she's got all these parents texting her, right? All of her friends who have the number of their child psychologist friends saved and are asking gosh, what stack of apps should I be downloading to try to support my child in this situation? Because of course, there was like a huge gap suddenly. We, we actually see this every summer. There's this thing called the summer slide where kids are worse readers at the end of the summer than they are at the beginning. We basically saw that happen on like a macro scale. A huge impact, a huge impact, negative impact, both in absolute reading scores. They are the lowest in the US since they've been recorded. They're also very low globally. It aggravated disparities. Lots of studies that show that, including a, a recent Stanford one. And it left parents feeling, I think, quite helpless. It's just, holy moly, this is now on my shoulders. And if I don't do something about it, my child's going to fall behind. A subset of parents, of course, then started forming pods and had one-on-one -on -one tutors. And so that would get vaccinated early and come to people's houses, but a lot of kids didn't. And so we started looking around, okay, what's, what are the apps that, that, that exist out there? And we just didn't really find anything that was that compelling, to be honest. It was a lot of trying to take the classroom online and gimmicky and gamey, but not actually working on the core skill, which is reading out loud, right? Like actually, and or it was labor arbitrage of some sort, connect you with a one-on-one -on -one tutor over Zoom, which is great, but it's not scalable to the nth degree. And so at the same time, this like wave of AI tooling, of course, is coming in. And we're like, okay, there seems to be an opportunity here. There seems to be an opportunity here, in particular to, to leverage speech recognition, speech perception technology to provide much better targeted reading support. So you, I think background research on you guys show that your product outperforms OpenAI's Whisper and Google Cloud's speech API. What makes the proprietary speech recognition so unique? Did you guys uh, like build um, those? Did you like grab a bunch of open source frameworks and then build it from there as a foundation? Or like, how'd you guys build this speech recognition? Yeah, I guess I'll share the basics that aren't, that aren't as proprietary, but I think yeah, it's basically, we looked at it in 2020, 2021, 2022, we, we were, as we were trying to build this, we looked at everything out there. We were like, okay, it turns out like if you just hold up the notes up on your phone and hit record or to a five-year-old, it just does it totally breaks. Like nothing worked at understanding kids. And so we just looked at what's state of the art in speech right now. And there was this paper called Wave to Vec. That, that came out of uh, Facebook that uh, leveraged the idea of self-supervised learning for speech perception. It's basically, if you're familiar with this stuff, it's, it's BERT applied to audio, BERT language model applied to audio. It's self-supervised learning for speech recognition, which means it solves the data scarcity issues that you have for kids. In, in, in some sense, we don't have much labeled data of child speech. We have a lot of it for adults, like in the form of this stuff, podcast recordings that have been getting transcribed, audio books, like lots of places of parallel text and transcript, which is like that didn't exist, doesn't exist for kids. Largest academic data set of child speech is like 400 hours, 200 of which are transcribed. So that's minuscule compared to the labeled data that we have available for adults. And so Facebook built this model originally with the idea of making it work in like low resource languages where we don't have much training data. And we're like, okay, I think the same idea could be applied to kids. So let's track those guys down. And so we hired Henry Zoe, one of the, the architects behind wave to vec and, and made Michael Owley an advisor. He runs the, the team at Facebook and, and basically built the world's best child speech perception model. And yeah, of course it's some, you can guess it's some adapted version of that and at this point we're able to leverage massive troves both of open and proprietary labeled and unlabeled data first the bad news sap business ai won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in southeast asia or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. 
so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. That's cool. And I guess, do you guys use Gen AI or what role does Gen AI play in the development of your product? Do you guys even touch it at all? Or was this like, we, or did you guys actually build it before the big Gen AI wave? And we started, we started working on Allo at some level. We started working on it before ChatGPT, but we always had this dream, this vision that we would be able to build a real one-on-one -on -one AI instructor that's able to respond in the way that a human would. And so there's two barriers to that, that we saw getting solved. One is the speech perception piece, but the second is Gen AI. It's the ability to, once you have a hold of the conversation and once you understand what's going on in the learner's head, it's being able to generate a response that truly feels human. And yeah, there's tremendous opportunity in that, obviously. Everyone kind of says, oh my God, like chat GPT is a, could be a tutor. And yeah, it can. Don't forget about that first part, right? Like you, you don't want to forget about the speech part. And if you want to do this for, for, for a five-year-old who doesn't read, the correct interface for it does not look like chat.openai.com, right? But so the, the short answer is, we have a, a forthcoming product announcement later this fall. We want to be very cautious of, of making sure that when we put these things in front of kids, they are safe. But we obviously believe there is enormous potential in generating personalized learning content for children and in building, in building human level learning experiences and interactions that feel real. So give you a very brief example of what that could look like. You got a five-year-old, they're struggling with reading some piece of text. We have a speech perception model that can disseminate at the phoneme level what they're struggling with. And so we're like, okay, actually the blend, the SH blend, they, they can't, they don't realize that S and H makes shh sound, right? We know they like sea creatures. Hey. Let's make up a story about sharks and shrimp swimming in shallow waters in order to practice the skill that we taught them in isolation, things like that. Oh, that's really cool. In your past, you've developed AI-based augmented reality therapy for kids with autism. You want to just give me some background info on what that is, what you do and like any cool results that came from that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. This was a, a project called the Autism Glass Project. And basically uh, it was an idea originally inspired by my, by my cousin who, who was autistic, is autistic and very luckily, I think managed to do super well. But one of the things that he and a lot of um, other autistic kids struggled with was emotion recognition, reading the social cues that we take for granted in conversation and being able to act on that information. And he's done enormously well with, with all the resources that, that his family has been able to access, but a lot of families are not as lucky and there's sort of huge disparities in access to therapeutic care for autism across the world. And so the idea was to build a learning aid that, that would center emotional recognition as like a, just like a learned skill. And so basically it's based on, it was 2013, right? And we were like messing with Google Glass because that was fun stuff at the time. And what's Google Glass is basically like low power Android phones strapped to your head with a camera. We were like running this like face tracking algorithms. So, oh, okay, we can use this to just run computer vision and basically recognize facial expressions and give you a cue right then and there. And tell you that somebody's happy, sad, angry, either in your field of view or through an auditory clue. It turned out at the time when we started this, I, I thought it was going to become a company. It was a terrible idea. Nobody wanted to invest in it. Everyone thought uh, Glass is probably not going to make it as consumer. But it turned out, of course, they were right on that axis. But there was a niche use case here that made quite a bit of sense. And I brought this into, into an academic program and turned it into a research project at Stanford during my undergrad. And it was my honors thesis, master's thesis, every class project and every class I ever worked on became two million uh, in funding from NIH and, and, and NSF, the Packard Foundation, Google donated the glasses, et cetera. And we brought in uh, over the course of three phases of clinical trials, about 150 families that took these glasses home and then used them in comparison with, with, with standard of care therapy and found that indeed it does seem to, it does seem to improve 
emotion recognition capacity on gold standard outcome measures. And so that was really cool to see. It's since been licensed to a company called Cognoa with an FDA breakthrough designation. And the trials were put on ice during, during COVID, but there's new stuff coming forth there. And hopefully we'll actually see it turning into a reimbursable, into a reimbursable therapeutic. So in, in terms of like childhood apps, like how do you provide, like how does that app provide feedback in a positive, constructive manner that doesn't deter like a child from reading? What type of safeguards do you have in place that ensures that the kids are getting like this positive, constructive manner? For the autism learning it or for ALO or in general? Just in general. Like how do you ensure like there's safeguards in place? Got it. Yeah. Gosh, it, it's such a huge responsibility, right? Because yeah, we think about that very carefully. I think with the autism stuff, our, we always read it as our role to to provide kids more information. And so it, it, it's, it was never to like normatively decide what they're supposed to do with that or whether in the circumstances they're supposed to smile back or not. It was, um, I just viewed it as, hey, if we can provide more information, then that's going to be a useful tool. With Allo, it's quite similar. I think right now, the, in the current Allo app, every everything is designed literally by a clinical child psychologist, right? And it's made to be a beautiful, engaging experience for kids and to be <laughs> obviously safe from the ground up. Now, once you start building more flexible systems that can respond in much more creative ways and leverage language models or image generation models and or those sorts of systems, and then the bar for safety is like completely different one, right? That's obviously it becomes a, a huge challenge. And so we built safety tooling and systems in the same ways that that other large model creators would there. And and we leverage humans in the loop in content pipelines and as safeguards until we feel thousand percent confident that that we have managed to steer safeguard and build the box around a model that keeps it operating within a certain frame and not outside of it now i think we have to realize that it's just like with self-driving cars or any other applications there it, it isn't going to be perfect and i think a lot of people are going to say anything less than perfect isn't good enough but i do i don't think that's quite the bar because humans are are imperfect teachers are imperfect uber drivers are imperfect and it's it's got to live up to the human bar of perfection and and of course it has a very powerful systematic impact because of how scalable it is and so it's got to live up to a pretty high bar of human perfection there's a healthy dose of pragmatism at some point that comes into it as well where you're like you've got a child in a place where there are no resources for them to be able to learn to read in English. You can create some, should you do that, in order to, to provide access to opportunity. Yeah, probably in the world we live in, probably. So with, with AI being such a dynamic field, it's growing every uh, it's growing every week. Like, how do you envision, like in your opinion, what's your vision of the future of AI in the educational sector? For instance, my I have an a, an old advisor for my PhD thesis, and he told me that his daughter would like play on the iPad so much that when she was given an actual like book, that she would take her finger and start and try to scroll, <laughs> and she didn't understand why like the words weren't. And so these kids that were raised on these technologies, such as like the iPads and whatnot, like they don't when they're given like analog mm -hmm. like items like newspapers books that they fail to like use it until like they're taught to like correct until we correct them so what was what's your vision on like kids yeah. in the future in the educational sector and then the emergence of ai into that field yeah yeah so first of all Elo, Elo's current product line works with physical books actually right you use a real physical book and and you read it out loud to this elephant who's very much sat next to you and less sat in front of you in, in that interaction paradigm, right? Like he's we're really trying to emulate 
a little bit what what a one-on-one instructor would do in that scenario. I think like with anything, there's on technology, there's enormous upside and there's potential to cause some damage, right? Our goal is not to, we, we don't think we're going to replace teachers at any level. Our goal is not to replace teachers. Our thesis is that teachers can be freed up to do the things that only human can do, right? Like we are believers in the magic of human interaction. We care about in-person work. We care about everything that happens when you bring people together. But like teacher to student ratios, and even in this country are like untenable and totally inequitable, right? And we think there, there is a way to return to being able to return to learning how we as humans were designed to learn, right? Like in high touch social experiences. And that just hasn't been possible by turning learning into an assembly line, right? Where everyone goes in and into school, does the same stuff and comes out the other side, educated and and indoctrinated. And we think that there's a way to build learning experiences that center on natural curiosity and, and wonder of a child and that becomes the launch point for an exploratory learning journey that is multi-sensory and multi-tactile and like the elephant tutor on uh, on on the iPad or the phone or wherever you might be plays a central role in that but doesn't play the entire role in that right there's lots of other things that happen outside of that setting as well so i'm curious on your thoughts on using AI to level the playing field for like kids from different social economic backgrounds. So, like if you got like the rich kids, like before AI and all that stuff, like all the rich kids, they would get like the best of the best education. All the poor kids, they would get going like public schools and get mediocre education. But with yep. the advances of AI, personally for me, I think that's going to level the playing field so that like, kids from lower yeah. families can still compete very well against kids from high income families because of that the abundance and the re- the readily available resource of ai tools to help these kids like learn and help them learn like very complex uh like information very quickly and it's more personalizable because of the way that ai is built what's mm-hmm. your take on that I totally agree. Yeah, our mission is to teach every child in the world to read from start to finish, regardless of their resources or environment. For me, learning to read in in English, growing up in Germany, was like the, it was like the unlock to the access of information. Right? It was oh, okay. You teach me to read in English. You give me a computer. And we can do a lot of the rest, right? Like I can teach myself how to build iPhone apps on loop. And I can like, there is a, an enormous amount of access of op- to, to opportunity that, that comes from that and fully agree, right? Talent is universally distributed. Opportunity is not a sort of a statement we very much believe in. And, and yeah, there's, there is, there's enormous opportunity and upside in scaling one-on-one instruction for precisely this reason. You just can't clone enough teachers to give everyone everywhere the, the, the best version of that. Gotcha. And then some other questions, like in regards to like ethical considerations, data privacy, overall mm-hmm. safety, especially around something as sensitive as like kids. I, I think there's going to be some level of like skepticism when it comes to using AI and like childhood or like children's education, is there any movement on that front? Have people switched their mindsets on it? Are they still there? Are there still skeptics? Is there a push from like regular, from like government regulations to get more AI into like children's education? What's going on in in that field right now in terms of safety, privacy, ethical considerations? Yeah, it's interesting. There is a good, it is a huge debate right now, obviously. And we are in, the, obviously, at the crossroads in the middle of that debate. We have a bunch of our own thoughts and, and practices. There is a good, actually, there's this good 100 page Department of Education report that came out a few months ago where a bunch of actually super smart people in government thought about this. And if you read it, it's, it's actually very balanced 
and you can see how it's almost like the two sides arguing with each other. You see, you, it's two people wrote this thing. I don't know exactly who did, but it feels like it's not one person. It's it's a it's a an, an enthusiast and a skeptic uh, who are having this dialogue, and it's quite a good read actually. Our take is it's an enormous opportunity, and and there's potential for pitfalls, and so our role is to try to do it our job is to try to take all of these challenges very seriously and just build good stuff and so the way that we do that is it goes into all sorts of layers of of this with for example talking about our speech models like our speech models run entirely on device so if you if you don't want to share audio data to improve the model no audio data ever leaves your kid's tablet um, it all gets processed locally. Um, that's a very conscious choice, right? Um, the way that we train our speech models has to inevitably pay a great deal to accuracy disparity statistics across race, ethnicity, accent, background, country of origin, all sorts of questions that manifest in people's accents and the way kids talk and when we think about how we correct kids, we want to make sure that it's similar to autism glass project stuff is we want to provide you the information, but we don't want to normatively necessarily steer you into, we're not doing accent coaching here. That's not what we're doing. We're, we're trying to teach you how to read, how to take the words from the page and figure out what they say, right? So that's where our responsibility stops. And to build an acoustic model that uh, has lower accuracy disparity. First, you got to measure the accuracy disparity. And if, by the way, if you're building an AI model in 2023 and you're not tracking metrics other than your F1 or word error rate, or right, you don't, you're not tracking bias metrics, it's what are you doing, right? And so we, we do that in the first instance, and then we actually collect data from our customers, right? So we have a large subset of people who does share much larger than I thought, actually, that when we explain it and we say, look, this like can make the product better. Would you be willing to share the data? Yeah, we would be willing to share it. Okay, now we got a safeguard. Let's take it very seriously. And then we email a subset of those people and we send them a survey that uh, asks them for demographic background information race, ethnicity, accent, background, country of origin. Do they have a speech and language pathology issue? How well does Elo understand your child on a scale from one to 10? And then we can look at that data. We can see how bad the problem is right now. By the way, it's, it's funny. It turns out that um, there is no accuracy disparity, but it doesn't come out in parent perception. And then we understand the imperfection. And, and then we can actually upsample in training pipelines and build active learning pipelines that say, okay, cool. We have accuracy disparity on this subgroup. We're tracking that. Let's go fix it right in the training pipeline and so we do that and, and we pay attention where possible and necessary we try to engage in dialogue around this we just did like an ai assessment with common sense media their inaugural batch of, of of ai assessments where they're basically rating companies on ai ethics that we submitted like long reports of here are our practice and here how is here's how we do this stuff lay it all out open for them and, and we want to be part of the conversation as this, as this, and become, yeah, hopefully we're going to make mistakes and stuff, but our hope is people are going to, in a uh, in few years time, they're going to point to Elo and be like, those guys are taking it seriously. It's almost symbiotic. Like Elo sort of stands for safety in AI for kids. Yeah. So given your work in identifying like racial disparities in the California criminal justice system. I think, you, that. Okay. I, think, I think you use NLP for that. Yeah. So how do you ensure AI solutions for kids don't like inadvertently introduce like biases, like the same types as the ones that you saw in the criminal justice system? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's just like in the criminal justice system, you have to look at every part of the pipeline. Right. It's like, gosh, I've learned this lesson a few different times in so many places, but like bias is this little thing. Right. So it's like the speech model and you go deeper and you go deeper. And, deeper. and people have written about this much more eloquently than, than I have. But yeah, in the criminal justice system, right, it's like starts with policing disparities. And what we were looking at was like the very end of the funnel parole hearing transcripts, which decide like who gets out of California's overcrowded prisons. And, and it's even at the very end, 
you want to you have to look at these considerations right and so it's the same as Ello, right it's the it's who gets access to the thing it's who gets to build the thing it's who gets to have a say in the conversation for how the thing is designed it's it's and then which it's okay like we're, we're a public benefit corporation we have it baked into our charter to our mission statement is baked into our charter which gives us the ability to when somebody sues us and says you're acting not in the best interest of the shareholders we can say yes but we're acting in the best interest of this mission statement and by the way in the long run if we're doing something that's in the interest of teaching the world to read we believe that's going to be in the best interest of our shareholders uh, but it, it's creating this sort of framework that gives us the freedom to operate in this way and then and then taking it seriously every every single step right so it starts with like business decisions on gosh can we make sure that we don't exclude low income customers even though it would be profitable to do so that we are learning about we would like user centered company right we employ like user centered design practices we need to learn about the issues they're facing in the first instance oh you're like tablets is like a 50 dollar kindle fire not a not the ipad pro i see okay the model behaves differently on that device than on other okay that's good to know right so you, you do that and then you get to language models and uh, and it, it just becomes like harder and harder right like the further you go down the pipeline i think you once you get to with with human moderation we have a great deal of input but that the arc of control or the mechanisms of control over these models right now are still fairly limited. And so I think it's going to take both us exploiting all the arcs of control. So what does this mean? What are the current arcs of control that people, that, that we have, right? We have fine tuning, we have models all built stack on models. We have syntax check stuff. We have RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback. We have like all the control mechanisms that you could use to steer and align a language model, align in the AI sense of align, align with the world's best kindergarten teachers rather than rather than a bunch of Amazon Turkers. But that's I'm I'm not certain whether the current we, we are figuring this out just like everyone else. I'm not certain whether the current amount the the, the current control knobs that exist are good enough to get to the point where where we'd be truly happy with it from that standpoint where we could look at it and look, and then that's going to be a moving target for right? school systems in America is like a moving target. It's not, it's not like there's like universal agreement here on, oh, okay. Should we be discussing fluid gender model in, in middle school or not? Good chunk of people tell you absolutely not good chunk of people tell you it's immoral. If you don't, teachers are flawed and, and it will be imperfect, but we just got to take it really seriously and keep talking about it and, and keep measuring it and acknowledge that it's a big problem. And Do you guys just finish up raising a Series A round? Is that right? That's right. Yeah. We just closed it. We just announced $15 million Series A. Nice. Can you discuss who disclosed who was in that round? Oh, yeah. Gosh, now I'm going to get like an email from whoever I don't remember to mention. <laughs> but uh, no, it was led by 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 Goodwater with substantial participation from things, reparticipation from a bunch of our early supporters, Homebrew, Project A Ventures, which which was one of the earliest funds to so back to my last company, and a, just a fantastic group of US and international VCs. That's cool. I guess, like, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs looking to go into the AI education space, what you did? Any like tips and tricks, anything that wow. you had to redo it again? What advice would you tell yourself? Wow. Gosh, I guess frame yourself so that you're something to somebody rather than being nothing to anybody. So it's a very interesting fundraising field at some level. It's a very interesting field in general. I think we're at this point where the investment landscape has has realized what a massive opportunity AI is. And they're not wrong, but the sorts of bets that people are, the large bets that people are making are largely in this, still in this like foundational infrastructure layer stack, which makes sense. It's if you believe that's going to be a big 
thing you want like a piece of the whatever like if you i don't know what the the, the the best analogy is, but if you if you think cryptocurrencies are going to be great, you want like a piece of the like ledger or whatever, right? If you if you think AI is going to be fantastic, you want a piece of the model stack. And they haven't really ventured out into subdomains as much, right? There are not funds that are dedicated towards no, we care about we purely do, they're starting to cop out now, but they're not at the same level. It's like purely AI in health tech, purely AI in education, purely AI in uh, natural sciences and purely AI and climate tech, et cetera, et cetera. We think that's going to happen. And AI is in education is one of the sort of most underestimated categories. And education in general has been like a more underestimated category because, yeah, people have looked at it. And I think it's going to be really hard to stay advice, right? I think it's going to be really hard because people are going to look at it. And still, there's a bias that like education is small market. Traditionally, the outcomes are small. There hasn't been a category defining at the company. And so you have one of two routes, right? You either position yourself as, as traditional ethic companies do their lower risk profile. They're safe. They're, yeah, if you look at like our ethic investors portfolios, their companies don't really fail that much. So you either become that sort of company, more limited upside, probably you're doing like school sales and you like really leverage their tooling for how to reach schools and, and they can support you with that. Or you try to go the other route. And that's what Ella was doing, right? Like we position ourselves a little bit uniquely in that space. And we say, yeah, yeah, no, that there really, there hasn't been like the same way that there's been like a category defining transportation company called Uber or like the, that sort of thing. No, we, we have the ambition to be the first one, right? We want to go all the way. And, and, and then you do get access to the, to the bigger, which are bigger pots of money to be, let's be honest, than the, than the sort of traditional ethic VCs, but you still need those guys, right? I guess choose one of those two paths and commit to it and build relationships on that basis because if you neither to either side it's going to be really hard gotcha gotcha and then if i needed to get in contact with you like how would i do that yeah i'm catalina boss pretty much everywhere on on social linkedin twitter um uh, those sorts of at lo.com so feel free to fire away so as we wrap up our I think you alluded to some exciting updates you guys were about to do. Can you just give a, a quick blurb on what the hot new thing that you guys are developing that's about to re be released on the horizon? I guess I can only say that there's a, yeah, there's a product announcement in the works. We're currently, we're currently testing things in, in closed beta. If, if you're interested in, in, if people are interested in taking a sneak peek at it, I guess do email us. Yeah. But, but wouldn't want to steal our own thunder. Cool. Thanks for joining us today. It was really inf insightful to understand how AI it was shaping the future of education and childhood literacy. And do you, got, do you have any like closing thoughts? Gosh, I'm just so grateful that we get to do this. As you mentioned, I think not a whole lot of companies do. It's, a, it's an incredible opportunity. We take that responsibility of being able to be one of those few companies that get to get this lottery ticket enormously seriously. We are in the lucky situation that we've been able to raise money in a downturn. And so if there are people out there who are interested in joining a mission-oriented team like that, we are still in the fortunate position to be hiring right now. Please send them my way. And yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you for uh, showing up. Cool. And to the viewers, thanks so much for tuning in today. And until next time, stay curious.